Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the fifth and final webinar of our five part series equipment considerations in cover crop systems. My name is Olivia Cayuet and I am a soil health program manager with the University of Missouri Center for Regenerative Agriculture. I'd like to introduce my colleagues, Aaron Gundy and Anne-Marie Calabro, who work at the Soil Health Institute. We three support the education component of Farmers for Soil Health. We also have Bethany Bedecker with the Center for Regenerative Agriculture, assisting with today's webinar behind the scenes. The purpose of this series is to provide farmers, crop advisors, conservation professionals, and others interested with information related to equipment considerations and cover crop systems. We're specifically focusing on spring cash crop planting following the use of cover crops. Farmers for Soil Health, or FSH, is one of many USDA-funded partnerships for climate smart commodities projects. FSH is a collaborative initiative of commodity organizations, the United Soybean Board, the National Corn Growers Association, and the National Pork Board, with a goal to increase cover crop adoption. This specific project provides an incentive to farmers who are new to planting cover crops or who have been planting cover crops for many years, as well as offering a sustainability marketplace to connect the farmer to the supply chain. State-level commodity organizations working across 20 states, stretching from North Dakota to the East Coast, are involved with FSH to provide local technical assistance and outreach planning. FSH has also developed a website full of resources and information helpful to any of you working with farmers or if you're a farmer or landowner. You can learn more about FSH at farmersforsoilhealth.com and Bethany will drop that link in the chat for us. And for your information, the deadline for enrollment of 2023 fall planted cover crops has been extended to March 15th. Then enrollment for 2024 fall planted cover crops will open March 2024 as well. During today's presentation, we will be discussing equipment considerations with Christopher Hudson from Middletown, Missouri. Lastly, a few items about today's event. This presentation is being recorded, and after the webinar series concludes, a final email will be sent in the next week or two with the webinar recordings posted to the FSH YouTube channel along with a final feedback survey. As questions come up throughout the session, please put them in the Q&A. You can upvote questions that you'd like to prioritize that we cover live. We'd like to make this as interactive with Christopher as we can, so we're going to try utilizing the raise hand feature in your Zoom toolbar so you can come off mute to ask questions. And if you'd like captions on, those can be enabled by clicking the three dots on your toolbar and navigating to the captions. Be sure to hang on till the end for information related to the one certified crop advisor continuing education unit for attending this webinar. With that being said, I'm excited to introduce our guest. Christopher Hudson is co-owner and operator of Triple C Cattle Company in Middletown, Missouri. Christopher graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in agriculture education with an emphasis in animal science from the University of Missouri. In addition to his farming operation, Christopher has been involved with National Future Farmers of America and taught agricultural education at Grand River Technical School and for the Bowling Green School District. During this webinar, Christopher will discuss equipment considerations on his farming operation following cover crops. As part of the FSH project, we were grateful to have been given a tour of Christopher's farm and have him share his thoughts about cover crops in a short video. We'll start by streaming Christopher's video and follow that up with questions. With that, let's watch Christopher's nine minute video to get our gears turning about equipment considerations when planting cash crops after covers. As questions arise, go ahead and put those in the Q&A feature for us to prepare to discuss with Christopher.
Welcome to Southern Pike County, Missouri. My name is Christopher Hudson. Uh, I own and operate with the rest of my family, Hudson Farms, as well as Triple C Cattle Company. We are a row crop operation as well as beef operation here. Uh, we raise 180 cow-calf pairs as well as raise corn, soybeans, and wheat. Cover crops are a huge way that we have not only saved our soil and hopefully uh, um, incurred some soil biology, but also for us, it's a huge asset to our beef operation. Um, it's a way we can supplement some feed um, and raise more cows on less pasture acres and keep our row crop acres uh, income producing and, and hopefully uh, better as well going forward. This particular field we're standing on was winter wheat last year. Uh, we actually applied chicken manure. Uh, after the chicken manure, um, we came in and drilled an eight-way cover crop cocktail. Uh, I think that was in early August. We actually came in then after that cover crop got about uh, this tall and uh, strip grazed cows on it. Um, after that, we kept cows off it um, until about a month ago. The last week of April, we turned cows in on this um, and they grazed us pretty hard for the last month. We actually just took cows off of it yesterday. The plan is to no-till it in the corn today. So we've got two planters here. Uh, one is specifically for corn and the other we use primarily for soybeans. Uh, both planters have some slight modifications, but the corn planter uh, probably is a little more set up for no-tilling in the cover crops. Um, so with that being said, let's take a look at the planter. For the most part, this is a stock setup, but there is a couple exceptions. The first one is heavy down pressure springs on the row units. Um, just for differences in soil consistencies, um, that's pretty important. The second thing, and the most important in my mind for our no-till environment, is our spike closing wheels. Uh, this planter is equipped with copper head closing wheels. I think in our uh, clay pan soils and our clay type soils, the spike closing wheels, even in conventional tillage, are really important just because it helps eliminate some of the air pockets in your furrow. Um, it, it improves seed to soil contact and it just makes uh, the soil more consistent in terms of, of, a go of a level finish for me. Most of the modifications we've made on this planter that I think are important for us are on the front of it. So with that being said, let's go take a look at the front of the planter as well. So like many people, we started off planting mostly soybeans in the cover crops. Once we saw the benefits there, it became pretty obvious. Um, we have more erosion potential in our soybean stubble going to corn um, and in environments like that. So we wanted to try to find a way to make sure we were no-tilling corn into a cover crop. And the more we tried that, the more we, we implemented those practices, the more we found we had some issues. And the big one for me was just getting enough ready available nitrogen um, to that young corn plant, that way we didn't affect yield early. So one way we've combated that, and I think actually we've improved our yields, um, is adding some two by two nitrogen. Um, this is something pretty uncommon in our area. We have pretty warm soils. Uh, we don't find, fight the cold environments that maybe Minnesota or Northern Iowa does. Um, but the two by two fertilizer allows us to have a ready, readily non-tied up av available nitrogen source right there next to the young corn plant um, from about emergence all the way to V5. Um, and that really gets us past some of what I think is uh, our, our challenges in grass cover crops like cereal rye or whatever, no tilling corn into it. So you can see this planter, we've got two by two cultures. We've got bulk storage on the planter. Um, obviously we've got red ball gauges uh, that monitor flow for each culture. Uh, we've got no-till cultures that basically are gonna slice through the residue. Um, and then behind that, we've got a knife. This knife in here is gonna deposit the fertilizer two inches down and two inches over from the seed. It's a source that when that corn plant's about this big, all of a sudden it's got roots in that sulfur, in that nitrogen source. I think another important thing to this planter setup is just some of the upgrades we've done to the tractor. We don't have a ton of row crop acres, so we've got to make sure we keep economics in mind. Uh, it's a 1991 model tractor, obviously not equipped with GPS or anything like that. Uh, we run auto steer in the tractor now, also has row clutches. I think that's something that um, is very important for me, uh, especially when no tilling into cover crops. It's sometimes a little harder to tell where you've planted, where you've not. Um, so that's another thing that we've added aftermarket uh, that I think has helped us, helped our yields, and helped us make this work. The 
So we're standing in a field today just across the road from where we were just at. We're planting soybeans here today, and I'm standing in front of our dedicated soybean planter. This planter, we used to plant in anything from the stubble we're in today to wheat stubble to cereal rye head tall to any other cover crop or no-till environment you can find. I think that this environment probably is more challenging. It was corn last year, uh, came off late. We drilled triticale in here the first week in November. The triticale uh, produced a really, really nice forage crop. Uh, we harvested the triticale as baleage to feed our cow herd. Um, through the winter. It'll be our primary forage source uh, through the winter months. So this is the bean planter. Let's take a look at it. So for the most part, this is just a common 3600 planter. Uh, it's got the inner plants for 15 inch rows. Front and back rows are set up exactly the same. It's got no-till cultures and it does have spike closing wheels. Other than that, it is fully stock. Um, I think it just helps so much in breaking up some of uh, that sidewall and, and helps you in some challenging environments, especially in moist environments. Um, just making sure you've got good seed to soil contact, you're closing that uh, seed trench. Um, and in dry environments like this, it just helps crumble that soil. And um, I think, like I said earlier, they're just worth their weight in gold. So yeah, we've come down the gravel road uh, just a little bit. Same farm, different field. Um, this field was a cereal rye cover crop that we no-tilled into when it was about boot top tall on about April 20th, so about a month and a week ago or so. As you can see, we've got a pretty decent stand of soybeans. Same planter planted this as we were watching earlier um, and talked about earlier. Uh, that planter, even though it's pretty stock, can, it can really uh, put soybeans in in a lot of different environments. Don't be afraid to try it. Um, everybody hears the horror stories, everybody hears the bad, but um, we've been doing this now for at least 10 years, probably 15, and I can tell you that uh, more often than not, I see value to the cover crops than I see an issue. The cover crops provide a primary feed source, really. Um, that's what our cows live on. Um, we do not bale hardly any fescue. Uh, I do have a little bit of brome, but uh, most guys, um, if, you, if you told them you're going to winter cows on nothing but uh, grazing cover crops and 40 acres of, of baleage, uh, they'd look at you like, you like you must not have many cows. And um, we're running quite a few cows on a limited number of acres. So it's been a great benefit for us. Um, it provides some forage value and also the, the environmental and, and stewardship value too. That was a lot of great information, Christopher. Really glad we could share that video. And before we, you know, dive into Q and A, is there some more that you can share about yourself as well as your farming operation? Uh, so I, I kind of got to thinking back before this, and so we started using cover crops in 2010, um, which actually I was in high school. Uh, Dad was a huge implementer of no-till um, back into the 90s, and then early early 2010s, he started using some cover crops. Um, the primary reason we started was for livestock feed. Um, and from there, we saw the soil health benefits and everything else. And it went from just a limited number of acres to add some feed to um, all of our acres uh, for the soil health and erosion benefits. So um, that's a little bit about our farm. Uh, you talked quite a bit about it in the video. And, and yeah, happy to answer any questions. Good deal. And yeah, don't be shy. Go ahead and drop those questions in the Q&A. And while we're waiting on some of those to come in, we can, you know, kick it off. I'm curious, Christopher, you'd mentioned in the video that both planters shown had various modifications, but the corn planter you said is better suited for no-till planting into cover crops. What difference comes to mind that makes it better suited for that? I guess when I said that, I was more prefacing planting corn. Um, the two by two fertilizer is just uh, so valuable for us. Um, we planted quite a bit of corn in the cover crops um, prior to investing in that planter and without a banded source of nitrogen and had some success, but we had to be very, very careful about termination, about uh, making sure we were applying some nitrogen beforehand. And a lot of times we were doing it broadcast. 
uh, methods. And the two by two just allows us to band it and it's right there. It's readable, it's readily available. Um, and it's just so much more concise, precise, um, just makes everything better as far as raising corn for us. Yeah, that's a great preface to the first question we got from Greg, who's actually with Missouri Soy. He's wondering how much nitrogen nitrogen do you apply in your two by two starter? And also wondering um, how much, when, and do you apply the remainder of your nitrogen? Yeah, so I guess there's no easy button, easy answer for me to summarize all our acres. Um, for us, it's a field by field case. Um, every field's managed a little differently for us. And a lot of it has to do with uh, topography. Um, for us, we farm on a lot of terraces, um, a lot of weird shaped field, angle fields, little patches um, that maybe aren't conducive to side dressing or in crop applications. Uh, where we can do that, we do. Uh, so to answer the question, there's some fields we'll put some pre-plant anhydrous on um, and then also two by two um, and then maybe come back with a with a top dress if we can um, on our better laying acres where we know we can put on um, some in season nitrogen. We may put uh, 80 units on with 80 units of nitrogen on with the planter and then come back and side dress another 70, 80 units uh, either in one pass or two. So I guess it's more on a case by case anywhere from. 25 units with the planter all the way up to 100 just really depends on kind of what our fertility plans are for that field. And to clarify, following up on that, Brett asked, what fertilizer blend are you running in that two by two? So the bulk of our acres, um, if you take kind of what I just said out of it and just look at the, the big majority of them, um, we're putting on 10 gallon of 32% two and a half gallon of ammonia thiosulfate, two and a half gallon of 1034O for a little bit of phosphorus. Um, and I've seen some good yield responses from that, even though we have some phosphorus applied in other ways. Um, and then also I'm putting on a quart of zinc and, and a little bit of boron as well. Um, but, but again, it kind of depends on scenario, but that's kind of a general uh, fertilizer blend of what I'm doing. Awesome. This is very valuable insight. Um, one question um, is, how did you decide to use triticale as a cover crop following corn? So I guess uh, for us, the triticale is less about the cover crop and more about the forage. Um, triticale is such a good forage. Um, it is my favorite cool season uh, spring, spring harvested crop other than oats. Um, I love some spring oats. The problem for us here in Northeast Missouri is we never know if we're going to get the opportunity to get those oats in, in February and March, a spring like this one, it's pretty easy. Uh, a spring like 2020, well, you, you just never got that opportunity. And for us, it's a have to, we have to have that forage for our cow herd. So triticale is our best option. We can get it in the fall. It's there. Uh, as long as we get some fertilizer on it, we're going to get a cutting of hay off it. That's why we, the primary we, reason we use triticale. Perfect. And that feeds right into Charles's question. What's the fertilizer program used for your baleage and uh, yield that you're getting? Well, of course, that, that can change a lot year by year. Uh, a typical year for us, though, um, we're putting on about 60 units of nitrogen, sometimes 80 um, if we need some early tillering. Um, I'm, I'm a true believer in our, our wheat for grain and a two-pass nitrogen system. Uh, but with the triticale, a lot of times we'll just put on one for convenience. Um, so it kind of depends on how many passes we're put, planning on. Um, and then estimated yield can vary a lot, anywhere from three ton an acre to eight. Um, I'd say a good average for us is somewhere in that five to six ton uh, an acre range. Uh, like the crop that uh, in the video, I think we pulled seven and a half bale an acre off of that farm. So uh, somewhere in that seven ton range. And sticking with the triticale, um, we had another question come in. When do you plant your triticale for the purpose of baling it for forage and approximately when do you bale? 
Yeah, so <laughs> um, that varies year to year as well. Uh, so the, the triticale in the video actually was planted really late. We got behind that fall um, and it was planted like the first couple days in November, um, which I think if you read a lot of uh, recommended seeding, that's probably too late. Um, what I've found is we just up our seeding rates a little more, hit it with some early nitrogen and we can make up our tonnage um, when we're planting late. This year though, I planted triticale uh, the first day of October. So it really just depends for us when we have the time and manpower to get, get the triticale in the ground. Um, if I'm recommend, I, I sell some cover crop seeds as well. And if I'm recommending to a customer, optimum is about October 10th through October 20th. And when we're talking about the baling, I want to plug in a quick disclaimer as well. The National 340 Conservation Practice Standard does allow baling, but for the purposes of cost share projects like Farmers for Soil Health, I want to encourage enrollees to talk to your state representatives because those um, guidelines do vary from state to state. Just something to be aware of. Now, you described a lot of the benefits for seed from baling covers for your cattle forage. What special considerations do you have knowing your covers will be used for feed, such as like your residual herbicide from a termination? Yeah, so uh, for us, we don't have to worry about that very much. Um, a lot of our in-pass or, or herbicide from our corn crop, um, we don't have to worry about residuals for triticale in October. Um, for the most part, I don't spray or uh, no herbicide application on that triticale itself. Um, every now and then you'll notice um, a little bit of hen bed or whatever when we're baling in the spring, but that triticale, much like cereal rye, is just so aggressive. Uh, it shades out a lot of weeds. Um, not to mention the chemical, um, chemical natural preventators for weeds. Um, so it really, that's something we haven't ever had much concern with. And then as far as termination, um, so when we bale that triticale, uh, if we bale it early, um, let's say uh, the end of April 1st of May, um, before that stuff really, uh, if we're trying to shoot for flag leaf or, or, or just at head, um, we will have to go back in and chemical terminate with some Roundup because some of the tillers uh, will try to regrow. Um, but if it's later, like in the video, uh, May May 15th or so, um, a lot of times just uh, mowing and baling that triticale, um, we don't need a burn down pass. Um, so we get by with just one post application in our soybeans and do so with really, really clean soybeans. It's not like they ever get weedy. So um, it's it's another benefit for us as well. Very helpful. And now, now we know corn can be finicky. Greg had a question about what is your favorite cover crop ahead of corn and what timing do you shoot for when terminating that cover crop ahead of corn? Yeah, so I guess that's a question I'm going to answer two ways. My favorite cover crop ahead of corn is where we've had winter wheat the year before and can get a good cocktail in a nine, 10 way cocktail in the previous summer um, and then plant corn the next spring, um, such as a uh, um, sorghum sedan grass, pearl millet, oat, crimson clover, turnish radish with some sunflower type mix, um, and then maybe throw in a few other things as well. Um, that's my favorite. However, uh, most guys don't plant a lot of winter wheat. We do um, some, but some of our acres are also soybeans going to corn where we, we're doing that, a lot of those species I just mentioned aren't an option just timing wise. Um, so in, in scenarios like that, um, I really like a barley crimson clover mix. Um, if we can get it planted early enough, um, if the soybeans come off early enough or if I'm gonna fly it on, um, if I can't, we'll go to like a cereal rye crimson clover mix or something like that. Um, so I guess that was kind of moving down in my preference of cover crop blends in front of corn. Um, and, and then the management changes too. So I've talked about how nitrogen, um, how our management changes field by field. That has to do with it too, what cover crop we're following. So I guess all of it kind of ties to that together for us. And there's no 
one size fits all for our farms. Um, we can be across the fence row and doing something different. Yeah, no, that's that's really insightful thinking of the whole system. And like you said, you know, when you're following soybeans, you have to take that into consideration what works well. We're getting a lot of great questions. Keep those coming. And Christopher, what experience have you had with planting green and how have your equipment considerations differed when planting in, how has that differed from when planting into cover crop residue? Yeah, so planting green, we do it uh, quite frequently. Um, I love it, um, especially with soybeans. Um, my favorite thing to do, I, I like everybody else in Missouri have been playing with planting soybeans earlier and earlier. Um, if we can get soybeans in the ground um, middle of April, I wanna do it every single time. Um, and then my favorite thing to do is actually let that cereal rye, if we're no tilling into a cereal rye cover crop in those soybeans, let that rye grow a little while alongside it. Normally our springs here in Northeast Missouri are pretty wet. Um, I love it because that cereal rye helps use up some of that excess moisture. Um, so we may not terminate our rye till May 15th um, when the soybeans are, are first or second trifoliate. Um, that's my favorite thing to do. It allows that rye to get big and as well as uh, you, you get some of those benefits from planting those soybeans early. Um, however, we don't do that every time. It depends on planting date, but then it also depends on weather. Um, I know that's one thing uh, some of my customers and I have talked about a lot from last year and also what it looks like the weather pattern for this year. Um, you know, termination of rye, if it's the opposite and going to use up all your moisture, maybe we need to terminate it earlier. So going back to machinery, there's not a lot of difference for me. Um, you saw our bean planter in the video. Um, we may adjust a few settings such as closing wheel down pressure, but other than that, it's basically the same planter for, for any of those scenarios. Okay, very helpful. And you had touched on a little bit, you know, how those weather conditions impact your um, equipment settings for planting cash crops. Is there anything particular, especially with your bean planter, whenever you have wet or dry conditions that you need to take into consideration? Yeah, uh, for sure, as we talked about in the video, uh, closing wheel as well as closing wheel down pressure. Um, there's a lot of times that we can plant ground in our long-term no-till and long-term cover crop ground uh, where we've got a little more, um, I guess our soils are, our soil profiles better um, and we can get across some ground that maybe my conventional till neighbors can't. Um, so in order to do that, we also have to worry about closing the seed slot and maybe a little more down pressures needed, uh, maybe uh, making sure our, our spike closing wheels are um, in good condition um, and, and not worn at all. Those are all things to consider, but um, honestly, it's still the same planter, the same setup. It's just maybe some little closings with the planter, the same as you do maybe switching farms. So just adjust uh, down pressure and adjust, um, adjust uh, your planting depth. Um, but other than that, it's pretty similar for us. And you had mentioned those row clutches in your video. Are you able to elaborate on how those have helped you with no-till planting into covers? And in addition, how did you go about making that aftermarket upgrade? Yeah, so both of our planters uh, did not come stock with any sort of uh, point row clutches or anything like that. Um, we have added on both planters, those things aftermarket. Um, for me, it's uh, very, very important, uh, especially in our older equipment where we don't have the newest and latest, greatest GPS. A lot of times I'm just fighting, uh, you know, making sure I'm planting where I should. And those row clutches have allowed me to quit worrying about where the planter's picking up, where the planter's setting down, uh, especially in cover crops, that's harder to tell. So it's been uh, very, very good for us. Um, I know if you're going and buying a new planter, that's something you don't think about. Um, but for a lot of smaller farmers in my area and for a lot of my customers, um, a lot of us are using 1990 model equipment and those things, uh, you have to add afterwards or go buy a new planner. And there's only one of those two options that economically makes sense. 
and we had a question come in while you're talking about um, equipment. Do you have, do you, or have you previously used row cleaners perspective on why you do or don't? Yeah. So that corn planter has row cleaners. Uh, they are not um, floating or anything like that. They're fixed. Um, don't get me wrong. It's on my want list. I'd love a good set of, of clean sweep or something like that on a planter. Um, however, that's what I have currently. Um, I like it, especially like there where we grazed cows. Um, sometimes, um, especially in those cover crop cocktails or whatever, it helps sweep the maybe sedan grass stems or whatever, the sun hemp. Sun hemp's a big one. It's a very woody um, plant type. Helps sweep those things out of the row, and I love them. Um, can you repeat the question, make sure I'm answering it? Sure, yeah, you you hit on it. The question was, do you have or have you previously used row cleaners in perspective on why um, you do or don't? Yeah, so I think I kind of answered that. And yep. going forward, it's definitely something I want to continue to invest in. Sure. And, and that's a good point. It's, you know, you're doing the best you can with what you have. And I'm curious, someone who is, you know, getting into cover crop adoption, they aren't in a position to go out and buy new equipment. What are some of the, like the first or top two equipment modifications you might recommend that they look into when using cover crops? So full circle, um, the bean planter in the video is the planter we had our primary planter before we purchased that 16 row corn planter. Um, so it did all of our corn planting, everything. Um, so you can see kind of how we've invested over time. The first things we did is we added GPS and auto steer to the tractor and row clutches. Um, that was for me, the biggest things. Then we added the spike closing wheels. And if I was making a recommendation, it'd be that order. Um, Row clutches probably first, even before auto steer, just from a, a economic standpoint, if you can save some seed, and this is coming from a seed guy, um, you need to do it because uh, seed's not cheap um, and none of us like it. Um, and in a cover crop scenario or a no-till scenario, it can pay huge dividends. Right. And we have another question come in from Charles. Do you have any issues harvesting soybeans that have been planted into green cereal rye? I'm not going to say never. Um, we have had a few issues here and there, but our issues have been very minimal. Um, it's frustrating because our minimal issues are maybe at on a dewy night. Um, you may have to stop cutting soybeans 30 minutes earlier than the conventional till neighbor across the fence. Um, that's the frustrating part, but in the grand scheme of things, that 30 minutes, um, probably doesn't amount to a whole lot. Um, so that's been my issue. Just cover crop wanting to drag up. We run a lot of cover crop material through a combine. It seems like, um, when we're cutting soybeans that have been planted in a nice big head tall cereal rye, um, I consider that a good thing. That's that much more residue going back on the ground. Um, and with the one exception I happened to quit a little earlier, that's been our only issue. Now, jumping back to termination considerations, what special considerations um, might you have? Like, can you explain some of your cover crop termination methods that you've used? Um, how that decision impacts your subsequent cash crop, especially considering the abnormally dry conditions you've been experiencing in Missouri? Yeah, so uh, there's lots of variables on timing of termination. Um, so let's talk about corn a little bit. Um, if we're grazing it, obviously we're not going to terminate until after we're done grazing. Um, a lot of times I'm pushing pretty hard to plant corn when we're pulling cows off. So sometimes planting corn will be terminating um, even two days after it's planted. Um, on the flip side, we will terminate some stuff maybe a week before we plant corn. Um, so it really depends on cover crop type. It depends on if we're grazing it, if we're not. Um, for example, I, I'm always in a little more of a hurry to terminate our cereal rye because we planted later in front of corn than if it's a oat 
crimson clover mix or a barley vetch or something like that, I'll let that go a little longer. Let my vetch bloom or my crimson clover bloom and try to make some uh, some nitrogen that way. So there's lots of variables to that. It's, it's again, on a case-by-case -case scenario. Um, the soybean side, as I mentioned, if it's dry, we may terminate, you know, some of it I'm even thinking about terminating here in the next couple of weeks. Um, if, if we've got lots of rain in the forecast, we're going to let it get big, um, use up some of that uh, moisture that's there, and we may terminate three weeks after we plant to the day we're planting. If we're planting some late soybeans, there's just lots of variables in case by case. And I find it really inspiring that you said, you know, your family's been doing this since 2014, since you were in high school, and you ended your video saying, you know, get out, try it. What suggestions do you have for someone who is new to cover crop adoption and is looking to try it? What are some ways that they can experiment on their operation? So if it's someone brand new to cover crops, never used one before, um, there's two scenarios that I suggest. The first one, do corn to soybeans first. Um, plant soybeans into a cover crop first. It's much more forgiving. The fertility concerns aren't as big. Uh, nitrogen management, you don't have to worry about as much. So let's start there. Let's have some success. And it's very easy to have success with a cover crop program if it's corn stalks going to soybeans. Um, use some cereal rye. If it's early when we're seeding it, we'll maybe throw some turnips or radishes or something in for some soil health benefits. Uh, but that is such an easy thing for me. It takes less management. Um, it's just a really easy way to, for a grower to have some success um, and to kind of get the bug and then expand from there. Um, if a grower is dead set on, hey, I want some cover crops in front of corn, um, a, a, a good way to have some success for me is if we can find a field that is winter wheat going to corn the following year, let's start there and use some red clover, um, very old school in that thinking and maybe not um, as traditional or trendy in today's um, environments, but let's find some winter wheat, frost seed, some red clover in it, um, and then plant corn into that uh, red clover stubble the following spring, or red stubble clover, we call it, the following spring. Um, I think that's great because the red clover is so good for soil. Um, there's a reason our grandfathers were plowing down red clover. And even though we're not gonna plow it down today, the soil health benefits, the erosion control, not to mention you're probably gonna make some nitrogen, um, is just awesome. And one more thing to, to share about that, the best corn we've ever raised um, was winter wheat followed by a year of red clover. We took off a, a red clover crop, we baled it, made eight bales an acre. We then went in and no-tilled corn June 1st into that red clover stubble we baled um, and raised 260 bushel corn on 80 units of commercial nitrogen. So just full circle, that shows what your clover can do. Um, and for our, our area, that's a pretty good corn yield, um, especially with only 80 units of nitrogen. That's some helpful advice for those new cover crop adopters and ways that they can um, work towards having success now, that integration of livestock is a really interesting component of your farm. We've had several questions come in about that. We'll start off with Matt's. What do you consider the forage grazing value of cover crops? That's hard to put a, a number on or uh, something like that. What I do know is that, um, for example, a cereal rye cover crop, I can get usually... Um, a cow per acre for 45 days um, off a cereal rye cover crop with good growth. Um, so right there, if you do some back figures on what it costs to house a cow uh, per day, I mean, that, that should give you some value right there. Um, and for me, I'd say it's 50, 60 bucks an acre, more than pays for the seed, more than pays for everything else. Um, and, and then on the flip side of that, let's talk about maybe some cover crop cocktails uh, following winter wheat. Um, we'll graze those. And for, for our operation, that is huge. Um, like many in Missouri, we've got fescue. Fescue is not a prolific producer in August when it's hot and dry. Those cover crop cocktails 
following winter wheat, when we cut the wheat in July, that's when you're, that's prime for them. That's prime grazing time. So we've been able to um, expand our cow herd because we're grazing those cover crop cocktails in August and September normally. Um, what's the value in that? I mean, pasture rent for us is anywhere from 70 to $100 an acre in this area. And you're getting the two most challenging months out of that cover crop cocktail. I can spend $50 an acre on seed, which is extravagant. And I wouldn't suggest everybody doing that. And I still feel like I'm doubling my money just on the on the forage benefit for my cow herd. So um, that's something I'm pretty passionate about is figuring out how to reduce costs for my cow herd. Um, and then, like as I've mentioned in the video, you get the soil health benefits too. Absolutely. And we had a question come in from Keith. What about hoof tracks when grazing cattle? Is that a problem? It can be. Uh, I, I won't stand here and or sit here and say that it's not. Um, some things I've learned in the past 10 to 15 years. The first thing is if it's muddy, you probably don't want cows running on that ground. Um which can be a challenge in a wet spring. Um, it may push planting back a little bit if you need to utilize that cover crop. However, in a wet spring, I've also found that you can um, tear up ground a little bit with a set of cows grazing it. And as long as you're planting those soybeans, um, when it's, I'm gonna say marginal on being too wet, you can fix a lot of your mistakes with hoof prints. And, and everything I've found is those hoof prints are, as long as it's not just muddy when you're making them, are very shallow. Um, so the compaction, everybody thinks cattle make a ton of compaction. In pinch areas, yes, they do. But just in general grazing, if you're grazing a 40 or, or something like that, you're not causing that much damage. And if you go plant those beans when there's just a little bit of moisture, it's kind of borderline. Um, in two weeks, you won't even know that there was that much hoof print damage out there. It's amazing how rain can kind of mellow that back out and if it's something that won't be mellowed back out with rain in a couple of weeks we're pulling cows off and going back to a dry lot or something uh, so we don't tear up the ground another question came in related to um your cattle integration with cover crops um could you describe how you manage your strip grazing program um, about how long on the field before moving, how large are your paddocks, how long have you been strip grazing? And I know there's a lot of questions in one, so I'm happy to revisit those as needed. So first of all, strip grazing, I'm not an expert on strip grazing. I'm learning as well. It's something we haven't done a ton of in the past on this operation in the last Three to four years, we've started doing more of it. Um, for our operation, labor is a concern and daily moves or something like that. It's just a, it, it, it's a challenge for us. So we don't do any strip grazing in the spring. Um, we do try to rotate as best as we can, but it's not strip grazing per se. On the flip side of that, in August and September, when we are grazing those cover crop cocktails, we do try to strip graze that. Um, just from a utilization standpoint. Um, I'm moving hot wire every two days when we're doing things or when we're in the, in the late summer when we are strip grazing those cocktails. Um, just from a labor perspective, I know daily moves would be better, um, but it's just not feasible in my operation. So uh, I guess it's kind of trial and error at first. We'll do Twice or uh, moves every other day, and I'm looking at utilization. Are we cleaning things up? Are we are the cows hungry, um, etc.? And then I adjust accordingly. So for me, it's trial and error. You know, like everybody else, I've done the. This is how much biomass we think we have. This is how we think we're going to utilize it. This is what the textbook says we should move. Um, but for me, trial and error is the best bet. If a cow's acting hungry after day one, I'm not giving them enough. If um, they're not cleaning it up in two days. I'm giving them too much. Um, so, and I kind of adjust based on that. What other parts of that question were there I didn't answer? I think you hit on just about everything. Maybe how large are your paddocks? Yeah. So for, so this past fall, I had a group of 60, um, 
dry cows. They were fall calving cows that we were moving there in August and September. And um, we were giving them not quite an acre every two days. Um, once they had calves on their side, I was up to probably two and a half acres every two days, something like that. Um, my utilization was probably down once I had those calves though. Um, and I was probably wasting a little more than I wanted, but I was a little more concerned about space with all those young calves. So I was willing to sacrifice a little utilization uh, for some, some health of my young calves. Good deal. And, you know, just um, before we close out, I'm wondering if you've noticed any additional maintenance requirements or anything that's changed with your equipment since you've started using cover crops or anything else you may want to add to our listeners? Um, there is nothing that just screams at me that it's added more maintenance. I will say the one thing that it's a very minimal thing, but um, it makes my mother, um, who's kind of particular about how things look, um, the planter tongue and the bottom side of the planter, you'll wear the paint off the bottom side of the planter just a little quicker um, because you've got the rye or whatever scraping the bottom of the planter constantly. Um, we're still talking something so minimal, um, but uh, that's one thing I have noticed. Um, maybe some bearings on some closing wheels going out quicker. If, if you try to plant some damp uh, with dew still on or something and you get a little wrapping, uh, for the most part, we don't have that issue though. Um, as long as I wait till nine o'clock in the morning or whatever to start uh, planting. So um, those are pretty minimal things uh, to me. Um, and when I say that those have been issues, they really haven't been, but um, you do pay attention to things like that when you're implementing uh, something new. Sure. That's really interesting to hear about your mom's um, aesthetic on the paint important to keep the family members happy. That's right. Especially the boss. Especially matriarch. Um, and with that, thank you so much, Christopher. I'll go ahead and close us out. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us online, asked really great questions, and for tuning in to all the other webinars in this series. It's been a wonderful discussion. I'm really thankful Christopher was able to join us to learn more about his equipment considerations and cover crop systems on Hudson Farm. And a short Zoom survey will pop up once we exit out. And I'll go ahead and share my screen to allow you all to get that CEU credit. Um, we're all also able to offer this CCA CEU credit for joining this webinar. Um, you can request the credit by scanning the QR code shown on the screen or by emailing me, Olivia Cayouette at Missouri.edu. Um, by this afternoon at 5 p.m. Eastern, if you're watching this webinar recording, we can't guarantee that CEUs will be available, but if they are, that information will be available in the YouTube video description. Last, after the webinar series has concluded, um, Today, here in about um, a week or two, you'll receive a follow-up email with a link to a final feedback survey, as well as the webinar recordings that'll be on the FSH YouTube channel, um, along with any other relevant resources we discussed. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself, Aaron, or Anne-Marie, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have moving forward. And thank you again, to Christopher, I hope you all have a great rest of your day.